preparing to enter the matrix in 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Good afternoon and welcome to this presentation of Navigating the Matrix, Strategies, Philosophies and Tools for College Students, Faculty and Administrators from Underrepresented Communities. This panel is hosted by Sphinx Connect Impact 2023 with support from the Yamaha Music Corporation of America. And now, presenting our panelists. Described as impressively solid by the Dallas Morning News, Amanda Collins has quickly become a highly sought after performer and educator across the US and abroad. Currently, Ms. Collins serves as principal horn of the Gateways Festival Orchestra, third horn of the Black Pearl Chamber Orchestra, and second horn so of the American says, Studio please, Orchestra. Says, please welcome, then you go on. She has performed with several notable ensembles, including Alarm Will Sound, Dallas Symphony, Kansas City Symphony, Memphis Symphony, Opera Memphis, Sphinx Symphony, Chin E. K. Orchestra. A dedicated chamber musician, she is a member of the Missouri Quintet and the Mizzou Brass Quintet. Ms. Collins is a passionate educator and is currently assistant professor of horn at the University of Missouri. A strong supporter of diversity and inclusion in the arts, Collins is the founder of the University of Missouri School of Music Inclusion, Diversity and Equity Collective. Ms. Collins is a Stevens Custom Horn Performing Artist. Please welcome Amanda Collins. The Hartford Current complimented her effortless facility, playful phrasing, and a sense of spontaneity that one hears usually only from the highest caliber of musicians. Since winning the Sphinx competition in 2002, Jackson has performed with many notable orchestras, including Atlanta, Detroit, Dallas, New Jersey, Milwaukee, and the Philadelphia Orchestra. She made her international orchestral and recital debuts in South Africa in 2002. Ms. Jackson has won numerous competitions and awards and performs on an Alberto Blanqui cello. Ms. Jackson has been a student of Janos Starker, Aldo Pariso, Joel Krosnick, and Bonnie Hampton. She is a graduate of the Juilliard School and Yale School of Music. Ms. Jackson is currently Associate Professor of Cello at Berkeley College of Music and Boston Conservatory at Berkeley. Please welcome Patrice Jackson. Woo! where he has served as conductor of the Wind Ensemble, Wind Symphony, University Bands, and coordinator of music education. Dr. Wooten received degrees in music education and conducting from East Carolina University, with honors at Michigan State University. He maintains a national and international schedule as a guest conductor, lecturer, and adjudicator, and is widely recognized and actively engaged in the areas of conducting, its pedagogy, and history. Dr. Wooten's research includes the unique contributions of black and other underrepresented composers and intersectionalities and functions of music in human societies. Dr. Wooten believes that it is critical for those of us who are engaged in the art and practice of music to actively assist others in their quest to find and recognize their own personal uniqueness. Dr. Wooten received the Award for Excellence in Undergraduate Teaching at Northern Illinois University. Please welcome Dr. Wooten. Williams has 
has distinguished himself as a multifaceted performing and recording artist, teacher, and administrator. Williams is Principal Horna, American Studio Orchestra, Black Pearl Chamber Orchestra, Color of Music Festival Orchestra, Piedmont Symphony Orchestra, and Sphinx Symphony Orchestra. Mr. Williams performs with the Gateways Brass Collective, Lyric Brass Quintet, and Rooftop Wind Quintet. Mr. Williams has performed with the New World Symphony Orchestra, Baltimore Symphony, Pittsburgh Symphony, San Francisco Symphony, among others. Williams has been featured on tours of the US, Russia, China, Japan, and UK, and has performed with Frank Sinatra, Ray Charles, Arturo Sandoval, Earth, Wind and Fire, The Roots, and other artists. Currently, Williams serves as Professor of Horn at Howard University and Washington Adventist University. Williams previously served as Assistant Vice Provost for Faculty at Johns Hopkins University. Larry Williams is a Yamaha performing artist and clinician. Please welcome Larry Williams. What you're all thinking. What is the matrix? Today we're going to talk about the matrix of higher education. Students, faculty, staff, administrators. We have three, three master navigators with us today and we're going to talk about some of the tips and strategies that they've learned through their careers that have allowed them to navigate being a new face in an old place. We're gonna center our discussion around three different questions today. And then after that, we're gonna have uh, an opportunity for a Q&A, and everybody here will have a chance to ask questions, and the people watching uh, online will also have a chance to ask questions. So with that, we'll begin. Welcome. So the first question is, can you talk about the value of finding and building community as a student, a faculty member, and or administrator? And Amanda, let's start with you. Sure. Um, so I could probably answer on two of those levels as a student and also as a faculty member. Um, when I was in school, uh, I went to the Peabody Institute, the preparatory, in high school. Um, there were a lot of black and brown students in the programs that I was involved in, and actually Larry uh, was my horn teacher. And so I learned very early on in my career the value of finding other people that you can connect with um, on that level to support you when you go out into the world. and. Uh, everything doesn't look the same. Everything is, is, you're quite different than everybody else. And I bring that up because I went to Penn State shortly after that, and there were no other black or brown, really, people in the brass area at the time. And uh, it was a, a students, I should say, and it was, it was a really strange uh, shift for me. Growing up in the Baltimore area and going and playing in orchestras where it was pretty diverse, and then going to Penn State, and it was just like, what is this? It was a huge culture shock. And so I had stayed in touch with Larry um, throughout that time, and one of his suggestions was, you know, see if maybe you can go to the Counseling Services Center and see if maybe there's a group you could join or something like that on campus. It might not be music or art related, but it might be other people who you could connect with, and I did that. And that was a huge um, support for me. And as I advanced in my career, wherever I ended up, I'm now, as you know, um, faculty at the University of Missouri, which is a very, very white pro program where I'm at. Um, 
keeping those networks alive and connections and coming to things like this has been invaluable. And not just in person and day-to-day -day at work, because unfortunately there, there are not a lot of connections for me at work, but there are when I you know come to events like this or texting friends throughout the day, um, it's really important to build those those networks and to maintain them. And you know what else? I know a lot of people don't like social media sometimes, but it's been real helpful having Facebook, especially when we went through the pandemic and we didn't have FaceTime a lot. It was really helpful to get on your newsfeed and you see your friends and you do creative projects with them online. It just, it was invaluable for sure. Patrice. Yes, so I, I can speak again on the two levels. Um, as a student, um, when I entered the certificate program at Yale University, so that's the program I went to, I was the only black and brown student for a little while. And not only that, I was one of two that was under the age of 21. So it was very, very, <laughs> I was a minor minority on several different levels. Um, and the person that was most encouraging was my cello teacher, obviously Mr. Pariso. And But outside of that, I kind of had to find my own community. And what I did was, I figured out that just down the street is a huge um, cafeteria that all of the undergrads um, would eat at. So I would go, but I would sit by myself and just be fine with that. And then it led to <laughs> getting to know other people, and then next thing I know, I'm sitting at the black table. Um, and it's unfortunate that it was that at that point. It's not like that anymore. But I'm just saying, um, that ended up being my community, and I, I was really um, fascinated with our culture on the campus, and I, I joined different organizations because of it, and I pulled my cello teacher into some of the performances. So it ended up being a very educational experience. Um, when I went to Juilliard right after that, I was not the only black or brown um, student there, but I did find my own community and it helps to have a community, and they don't always have to be black or brown in the community. They can be of any other ethnicity, race, gender, whatever case, but as long as the, you all are genuinely encouraging, supportive, because things get hard, just school in general is hard, just in general, and if you feel like you're by yourself or alone, it's easy to just say, man, bump this, I'm gonna go somewhere else, you know. I had other choice words, but <laughs> but it was always at those moments where God always placed the right person at the right time in the pathway. Like, hey, you good? Let's let's talk, you know. So it's important to have um, a, a it can be a small amount of people around you, but it, it it's very encouraging. I remember I did have a mentor who was um, African American, and she was in the educational outreach program. And she really invested her extra time in some of us students who were, who were struggling. I was one of them, academically. And she literally would stay at work till 10, 11 o'clock at night, tutoring each of us individually, making sure it was her duty to make sure that we all graduated. But have, not every school has that. Sometimes it could be an administrator. Sometimes it could be just another teacher. Um, but finding those mentoring type um, personalities and people and just clinging to that and because everybody needs somebody at the end of the day. Agreed. Ronnie? It's on. Oh. Is it on? <laughs> okay, good. Um, I'm old enough to remember um, my early education. The first five years of my education, I went to an all-black elementary school only time that we saw people that were not black was when it was time for accreditation or, or whatever. But it was all black classes with about 35 kids. And I can't tell you all the things that, that we did that I look back now and I appreciate what we did because all of a sudden in grade six, now integration, boom. And, uh, and here you are and, um, and there's just so much I could, I could say about that, but I'll spare you. But I'm saying all that to say, I went through three degrees, a bachelor's, a master's, a doctorate, and an artist diploma, and not one black professor or professor of color in all those programs. And my students are surprised, first of all, when I tell them about my early education, and then the fact that I went through all those degrees and, uh, and not one. But what I was able to do as an undergraduate and certainly as a graduate student 
were was to since there were no black I mean and not that you have to be black to be you know a community member I'm, I'm not saying that but I wanted that you know I'm like why can't I have that and but what I learned to do early on is to reach outside of my discipline to reach outside of my department and so as undergraduate now I did have a graduate assistant for health who was who was black but that was it and um, and when I got to graduate school, there were three um, black graduate conductors, me in wind band, one in orchestral, and one in choral. I think there was a conspiracy. They just happened to have one in each area. But we got to be very close. And again, there were no professors in there. And even the student, the, the, the music school population was not very diverse, but I had a friend who was there doing his PhD in higher education administration, and we got to be the best of friends, and so he knew everybody. His assistantship was actually in the medical school, so I got to meet Dr. Barbara Rossley, Diana's older sister, and, um, um, and Dr. Ben Cathay, an amazing biologist, and Dr. Cathay used to be bartender at the faculty club at Michigan State. <laughs> so he knew the tea on everybody. And so Dr. Cathay <laughs> regularly, regularly had us over to his house and we'd do potlucks. And I didn't know he was kind of wicked. He videotaped the whole thing. But he would oh. tell us all kind of stuff. And we'd have some good food and some good adult beverages. And but I depended on that and I needed that. You know, and then and the other mentor was Dr. Julia, um, um, I'm, I'm drawing a blank, Miller. She was dean of the College of Human Ecology. Julia Miller, the auntie of basketball player Reggie Miller. And so we got to know her and go into her home because she could cook house beautiful, she beautiful, you know, and everything. And so I found those mentors, you know, outside of music. Um, and then one, and one time, and I'll stop there. One, uh, uh, one time, uh, we did have one year they did a, a visiting scholar program. So we were fortunate to have uh, Dr. Eddie Meadows from San Diego State. Some of you all remember. I think he still holds the record for the most extensive bibliography of jazz materials in the country. I don't even know if he's still living, but he was there. Uh, we had Dr. Amy Brown from Florida State, music education, and she'd stand up there. And I went to everything that Dr. Meadows did, every presentation, every lecture, I was sitting right there. Dr. Uh, Brown, the same thing. And she'd stand up there and literally talk, quoting from this book that you've got in front of you. And she's standing up there just talking, word for word, what was in that book. And those of you that went to Florida State, if you know anything about Clifford K. Matson, the father of research, she used to edit for him, you know? That's like editing for God. <laughs> and uh, and, uh, and the, uh, the last person was Dr. Samuel Aquabot, and Dr. Brown has passed away. Dr. Aquabot was from Ghana, and he was a composer. And so same thing, I'd go to all the lectures that each of those scholars did, and they were each there for a semester, and I'd go, go to lunch with them, get coffee, can I get you some coffee, can I get you some donuts, what can I do? and get to know them, and I value that. I, I needed that, and um, now they have some black faculty there. They have a jazz program now that didn't exist when I was there. It's a very good one. But um, I believe in, like it says up there, uh, Sphinx Connect, making connections. It's very important to connect outside of your discipline and to go in places where you would normally not go to, to get what you need. Beautiful. I totally agree with that. When, when I graduated uh, from Peabody, I was very fortunate to get into New World Symphony and started my, my orchestral career. And after one year, um, some people from Florida International University in Miami came to, uh, came to a concert and uh, they came backstage after I was done playing and said, we have a French horn professor opening at our university and we would like you to apply. And I was shocked, and I had never taught before. But uh, you know, I think I said something like, "Yeah, I don't think I'm allowed to uh, 
to do this. And they said, oh, no, we've, we've, we've talked to Michael Tilson Thomas, and he, he, he said that this would be a great opportunity for you. And I was really, really lucky that uh, when I took that position, this gentleman here was my mentor. And yes. I could not have asked for a better mentor. Um, and he was my community uh, when I first started to teach. And it made a huge difference. Um, you know, I was in his office every five minutes asking him why. What is going on here? You know, is it, is it me? And, and we, had, we had great conversations, and he had so much wisdom, and he still does. Um, and thank you, Ronnie, for, for, for being there. You know, I really appreciate you. Um, so I'll leave it at there, just because we're a little bit late on time. And let's move on to the second question, which is this. Do you have any strategies to help deal with microaggressions, conflict resolution, bias, and inequity? Amanda? Uh, yeah, I think building on the first question, which is having your support network. So wherever I go, wherever I do, I'm always trying to make friends or if I'm feeling so socially awkward that day. Because I think I learned recently that I'm not the extrovert that I thought I was. Maybe the pandemic taught me that because I got some introvert tendencies now, y'all. Like, it's kind of strange. I don't know myself sometimes. Thank you. Represent. Shh, quiet. Don't talk. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> anyway. Um, I broke the microphone. Okay. The matrix, the matrix is on fire today. Um, so, so taking that, that support network of people, th not just in my community, but throughout my life, I was able to um, help myself. I'm sorry, I'm having, the microphone distracted me, and now I'm getting introverted. Are we good? myself like I normally did. My environment's completely different. I come from the Duke Ellington School of the Arts in Washington, D.C., predominantly black institution. Okay. okay, all right, very nice, very good. Um, to a predominantly white community that was not used to somebody like me, who's big in diversity, who is a big personality too, and I don't know that anything directly happened to me, but there were all these conversations that were really troubling to me and made me feel like I didn't belong there, wasn't welcome. In one instance, you know, I, I actually, I'm half black, my dad's black and my mom's white. And it kept, got back to me from a colleague that someone had said, well, she's not really black. And somebody making a decision about my race was like extremely triggering to me, um, especially being in that environment. And so I fell back on my community. I talked to Larry probably like every week and I would check in with him. I would talk to him on FaceTime. So not only did I hear his voice, which was issues being one of the first black band directors in the county that I was from. Um, he gave me a lot of advice on how to deal with it. And one of the things that I learned that's been really helpful to me is to protect my energy. So if I'm around somebody, and you can hear my voice shaking because I'm feeling it now, going back to that moment in my mind where I was like, I have a choice to make. I can like, get upset and cry or I can get angry and yell at this person. But I'm not going to give them that energy because I don't have it to give can't pour from an empty cup. So mm -hmm. I think taking care of yourself, wellness. I'm really big into meditation and yoga. Mm -hmm. um, it helps me feel centered and grounded and remembers. It raises me up above that energy. I think there are a lot of people that want to bring it down, and they will if you let them. But you don't have to. It's always a choice. Mm -hmm. At least for, in my mind it is. It's a choice to let somebody bring you down like that. Now, that's for small instances, you know, where <laughs> it's not that big a deal. I mean, we all know it's a big deal any time. But when there's something that really scary happens, it's really inappropriate. Um, I document everything. The second I started at my job, I started files. If there was something that happened, I was like, you know, this is kind of weird. Maybe I should just like print out this email and keep it in my filing cabinet or take a screenshot. And I'm not saying you need to like, you like, you know, crime scene investigation again, all these facts and stuff about people, but I'm saying that you have to protect yourself and protect your energy, and that includes also if somebody is doing something they should ought not to be, and you are the only person, 
they do need to have your evidence in front of you. Um, and so it came in handy a couple of times when I was uh, having some really peculiar conversations with a colleague and we just went to, I went to the director and said, this has been happening to me, what do you think about this? And she's like, oh, I see, wow, this is, you kept a lot of, this is a lot of paper. And I was like, yeah, I did, I kept a lot of stuff. And she was able to help me because I was able to provide a picture into what it looked like to be me. Because I think that happens a lot sometimes. We have people, um, we've been talking a lot about having black and brown allies, and you made a wonderful comment about they don't have to be black and brown allies. You know, friends, network, it can be anybody. Um, there are a lot of really good intention non-brown and black people who want to help. And to be able to pull up these, these instances and give them that window into what it's like to be you helps them help you more. Um, so I would say inclusion just to make sure that you protect your energy, you take care of yourself, you do nice. Every day I do something nice for myself, even if it's just five minutes, like I really like TikTok. It's wonderful, but it's awful at the same time because you react to it. But I'll let myself, you know, if I've had a particularly challenging day, or even if I haven't, I'll look at TikTok for a few moments just to disengage, or I'll listen to some music with my headphones on, I'll take a walk. And I also make sure I can on business at work and my professional engagements, and I keep documentation on everything. Okay, yeah, so in these institutions, institutions, I just feel like at some point um, somebody might say something, it's most of the time it's unintentional, but just being aware of what your own boundaries are. Um, as a teacher, as a professor, in the spaces that I have, I'm very, very, very blessed to be in an, an open environment like Berkeley that's very, very welcoming. Um, there's, you know, there's no box really. Um, so I feel free enough um, to be myself, um, my true authentic self, whatever you, people think that is, but I know what that is. That's all that matters. Anyway, <laughs> um, but there's no, um, I don't have any um, problems with anybody that I work with, but again, it, it starts with who my boss is. And that came from who our dean was at the time. And so, and unfortunately he's no longer here and we have an, another amazing dean. But between my boss and the dean at Berkeley in the strings department, I feel like I can just go to them about anything and they can actually hear me without reacting first. It's just hearing me. And then they're like, okay, so do I need to bring the gloves or do you want me just to talk? Or, you know, and, I, and there's a couple of things that have happened, very, very minor things now in the larger scheme of things. Um, but they walk me through this, the proper steps, so nobody by the time it gets to the top can say, oh, you just overreacted and did it. Did that. Um, so as an educator, just understanding who those people are within your space that you work with. Um, on the other side of it, since I am an educator, and um, I'm, I'm not the only black and brown person that I teach with, my other colleague is actually here. Um, but students tend to, you know, try to come for us too. Um, so it's, it's just been really you know, interesting because I'm very honest and I try to you know, be uplifting and try to give that positive energy and it still can sometimes be a negative thing. Um, and like you said, with negative energy, they wanna, they want company, you know? So with that said, I'm, again, I'm so honored to have people that are my, I call them my bulldogs at work that are like, they'll hear it and like, that ain't even, next kind of thing. Um, at the conservatory, I also have uh, protection, a little bit of protection there as well. Um, my boss is pretty cool. The dean there, actually, he and I went to Juilliard together. So that's amazing. But we've had some very difficult conversations and um, he makes a point to come to Sphinx Connect every year. And um, it's just something that he just finds very, very important. And we've had some hard conversations and He's helping me to, fit, to navigate things while I'm helping. He's asking for my help to understand and try to you know, appropriately handle things. So I think that it's important as an educator to understand those boundaries and understanding um, who those people, those go-to people are. Also, as an educator, I do want to put out there that unfortunately we can work with some people that are not great. And so as a person of color and a female, I'm the bulldog for my students, point blank period. So if a student comes to me about feeling uncomfortable about something I said or something that another teacher said, again, 
um, it's important to know those go-to people that are not just like, oh, why are you snitching? What's good? You know, like just understand that, okay, this incident happened. We need to take the appropriate actions. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. I, um, <clears throat> as they were talking, and I was sitting here, I actually pulled this up on my phone in less than an hour. I don't know how to work my own phone. But uh, so I'm going to try to see this. But I wrote this uh, last year. Now, in the state of Illinois, they have a, um, at the, the Illinois Board of Higher Education has a committee on um, not black concerns, but, but that's what it is. And so there's an, one of my uh, colleagues at Northern um, has created this um, uh, seminar. And she's been doing it, this is like the seventh or eighth year, but it's called Creating Black Faculty. And now she's changed it over the years, and so it's more Latino and you know more inclusive. But it started out as as black, and so I'm I'm on her advisory board. But I wrote this, and I'm a, forgive me for being a professor, but I'm gonna read read this because I ain't, I don't want to just to to let you know the kinds of things that I think about, and I've learned through good and bad experiences, and I share these as much as I possibly can, particularly with males of color coming into the academy. So I'm, forgive me for reading, and, uh, and I'll try to speak clearly. You know, I'm French, so you might not understand my accent. <laughs> North Carolina French. But, uh, <laughs> Men of color who choose to enter the halls of education as a profession are challenged by a variety of issues as they enter the classroom. This statement holds true at every level of education of the educational hierarchy from K-12 through professional graduate school. Males of color tend to be underrepresented in the academy at every level. However, research shows that there is a particular dearth of these men at the preschool elementary level and at the collegiate university level, particularly in white institutions. In many instances at PWIs, they were hired to bring diversity to the institution or a particular department. Yet, as they engage in the jobs that they were hired to do, let me say that again, that they were hired to do, they are confronted daily by many challenges as they attempt to simply teach. Often negative stereotypes of men of color in the academy create serious traumatic and professional issues for them. When viewed through the lenses of students who they teach, colleagues who they interact with on departmental and shared governance committees, and administrators who are charged with evaluating overall professional performance and assignment of annual responsibilities, there are numerous um, opportunities for men of color to be subjected to negative and possibly career-ending misconceptions from each of these groups previously mentioned that are often but not limited to race, anger, violence. And I asked the, the, the monitor in the room, I said, can I cuss? So I haven't cussed yet. But sometimes I am angry. That's an emotion too. You know, I'm, I am angry sometimes. I'm not violent, but I try not to be. But, you know, sexuality, masculinity, hyper-masculinity, competence, qualifications, and other issues, either real or imagined. These areas are not exhaustive, nor did I prioritize them. They figure into their, our professional lives as we navigate the potentially volatile areas of student evaluations when they write, why did we play all this music by these black composers? That one student put that in my evaluation. And so we don't see them till the following semester. But the following semester, I said, when someone comes in here and tells me, well, Dr. Wooten, you're programming too much Persichetti, too much Joseph Schwantner, too much Hindemith, too much Percy Granger, I said, then we can have a discussion about these black composers that you consider a waste of your time. <laughs> but, but, but again, um, um, Student evaluation, so they can, be, they can be harsh, but I learned not to read them, and it's not because I think I know everything, because I don't, <laughs> but I learned not to read them, but what I do know is more than, I've forgotten stuff that you haven't learned yet, so let's remember that. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but um, the other thing, uh, tenure and promotion, sabbatical leave, 
because you have to go through a committee process of evaluation by your peers. And people ask me, well, what do you, what is the most frustrating thing for you at the university level? And I say one of those things is peer review because you got a theory professor, no, 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 no offense, but over there evaluating you, but you haven't written a book, you haven't written an article, you haven't done a presentation at a conference. Well, I was in Peru last year. I was in uh, Trinidad and Tobago, uh, guest conducting, did a workshop there. Uh, at the uh, steel paying finals, you know, but here you are sitting in judgment of whether I should get a sabbatical leave or whether I should be promoted or whether I should be tenured. But anyway, that's a whole nother uh, conference. Um, <laughs> service reports and other professional development. But, um, but those are the things that I think about, you know, um, and, and I, I've got stories to go along with all of them you know, that I could, I could share, but we don't have time, obviously. But you've got to think about those things. And, and when you have students who come in because, you know, you don't look like them. Well, Dr. Wooten, I'm not, because I had a graduate student. Well, I'm not accustomed to having my papers graded in this way. And so I said, well, let me see your paper. So she handed it to me, and I looked at my comments. I mean, I didn't give a grade. I said, you revise according to my recommendations. And so I handed it back to her. And I said, you're lucky. And she said, what? I said that I'm not an English professor. I said, because if I took this to my, my colleague over in the English department, she'd find 10,000 times more things than I did. So I said, I'm just show, showing you what me, the music professor, found, evaluating you on content and structure. And I said, and you're already a teacher in the school. I said, and I have to tell you, and it was a white female, sorry. But um, I have to tell you, if I was a principal and you sent me a memo or a, a lesson plan or something that was written in this manner, I said I would have some serious thoughts uh, for your annual evaluation and as to whether or not you really prepared to be here. You know, I didn't cuss, I didn't yell, I didn't scream because, you know, I didn't want to, to be um, threatening, you know, the angry, but sometimes when you speak, you are the angry black man in the room. And so I just take on that role, you know, I just accept it. And, and sometimes it might get a little heated, but, but generally I'm not that way, because most of the time I don't talk, because I don't like to hear myself talk in a meeting. I'm ready to go. <laughs> I'm sitting in the back with my phone, worse than the kids, right? Sitting in the back with my phone, you know, texting somebody across the room, did you hear what she said? But anyway, <laughs> but I'll stop there, but I, I've got so much to, to tell you. He, he does. <laughs> <laughs> He, you know, he has so much to tell you that I'm, I'm not even going to comment on that last question. And we're, I'm just going to move on to the third question, which you're going to really love, Ronnie, which is this. Can you talk about the importance of finding mentors and serving as a mentor? I mean, I'm looking right at my first mentor. I met Larry when I was 12 years old, and I'm 37 now, so that's, that's you know, at least five years ago. <laughs> But he's, he's the one that's been around the longest and, and been with, with me through all of my life's ups and downs. And not just professionally, but I remember I brought my, uh, my fiance to meet Larry, to, make, to meet Uncle Larry, to make sure that he checked out. And Larry said, welcome to the family. I was so embarrassed, but we got married anyway, it's fine. Um, <laughs> but it, it is very important because there are moments that you need guidance. And when I first got to Missouri and I didn't know, you know how to navigate the, ma the matrix, it was my first full-time college teaching job. I had been adjunct before, but I never had to be on committees. I never had to deal with a lot of the stuff I was dealing with. And having someone who's been there and knows the ropes and can help you and you can rely on so you know, am I stepping into this the right way? Am I going to be received the right way? To have even just to bounce ideas off of um, has been invaluable. Larry was huge for me in that respect. Also, uh, he served as an excellent reference for me. So, you know, at the University of Missouri, I am a junior faculty member. Um, students, if you don't know, there's three levels of professor uh, that are full-time. There's assistant, there's associate, and then there's full. So I'm an entry-level professor. Um, and you do have to go through all these processes to get promoted and things, and there's committees that vote on you. I didn't know any of this, and Larry really helped me understand all of that. 
Um, I also have another mentor that I got more recently um, that helped me navigate going from non-tenure track to a tenure track professor, which is a big jump for me as well because that involves research. Um, that's Stephanie Shonikin, Dr. Stephanie Shonikin. She's now the Dean of College of Arts and Sciences at University of Maryland, but she used to be Senior Associate Dean of the College of Arts and Humanities at um, University of Missouri. And um, she was born in Nigeria, educated in England, and then lives in Missouri. And she took me under her wing. It's one of those moments, I, I know a lot of people in the room know what I'm talking about. When you see somebody, you make that connection, you talk to them, and like, oh, who are you? And then you start talking, and next thing you know, they're helping you. Um, she helped me navigate through that um, first couple of years of the tenure process and everything, just getting all my materials together and all of that. It's been invaluable. The other piece of it is being a mentor. So I recently started doing that. I've always mentored my students as part of my teaching philosophy uh, to be a mentor. I tell my students, once a student, always a student. I don't care if you're only here for a year or if you switch majors or whatever, you can always come back and talk to me. Um, even the kids I taught in high school and they end up going to different universities, you can always ask me. You can always call me. I'll always be there. Um, I also mentor for the International Women's Brass Conference. Um, so there aren't a lot of women of color uh, that play brass instruments. And so they approached me, I think, like two years ago and asked me to mentor. And I wasn't really sure what I was getting into, but I said, sure, why not? And I ended up um, mentoring a young white female trumpet player um, named Ashley Killam. And Ashley had just graduated. She was teaching some private students. And she was hustling really hard, trying to figure out what she wanted to do with her career. She knew she didn't want to be an orchestra. Um, but she knew that she wanted to play and teach, and she was really interested in diversity, which I thought was pretty interesting, um, given that she's just, you, you know, sometimes looks can be deceiving, but I, I would never have thought this person knows, like, all these African-American composers, African composers, Latino composers. I mean, she was so well-versed. She ended up starting, after her mentorship, and I talked to her about how I built my career, she ended up starting Diversify the Stand, which is a nonprofit that's publishing books for progressive solos by underserved and underrepresented composers, working on the Horn book right now. Um, she is also my manager now, so she has her own management company that she started, and um, she's doing all sorts of amazing things, and I definitely wouldn't even be probably sitting here today if she hadn't helped me figure out all the things I had to do to get ready for this trip. So um, if you are a person who, I, I'm also I think at the age too, this last thing I'll say about it is you know, when I was younger, I always looked up to people to help me, and now I'm the person that people look up to. And I take, I still take advice from Larry and talk to him and, and get his feedback, and I have, experience now to give to other people. If you're a person in any of these positions, find somebody or be that somebody for somebody. You could change somebody's life. I mean, I still can't believe the amazing things that Ashley did. And she says all the time, I find it kind of embarrassing. She's like, I probably wouldn't have tried any of this if you hadn't told me like how you came to be and what you did. So never be afraid to change somebody's life. Beautiful. I don't even know what to say after that. Oh. <laughs> I had mentors or people in a mentorial um, position in my life along the way to help out. Um, but I think the first, the first real mentor was Jano Starker. And I was fortunate enough to study with him um, in his later years. And um, for, again, for whatever reason, he just really, really, really invested time, energy, space for me. Um, I was still a high school kid. and. Um, he found it valuable or important enough to not only let me study with him the last two years of my high school years, but also for free. My dad was like, what? <laughs> we, do you want us every week? Do we need, do we need to come here every week? So we could do that. Um, so he drove the four hours each way from St. Louis to um, Bloomington, Indiana, um, because it was important. Mr. Mr. Sarko was important. Unfortunately, I didn't really like the schools a bit too big for me. I'm, I'm an introvert. <laughs> so he pointed me in the direction of Mr. Pariso and the rest is, and again, Mr. Pariso ended up being a mentor when I got to Yale. He taught me not only how to play the instrument, but he taught me how to be a beautiful, well-rounded um, individual. And so the African attire, I know everybody went bonkers when I won Sphinx because I, I did that. And it wasn't something to make a statement, it was just something that I liked. And it worked. And Mr. Pariso, the first time I wore some material around my waist, he was like, that's it. I need you to figure this out for every lesson from here on out. I was like, what? OK. So <laughs> and then, so then by the time I came to Sphinx, it was like my signature. Um, by the time I went to Juilliard, 
I already mentioned this before, but my mentor was Allison Scott Williams. She's still around. Um, the, the interesting thing about her was um, she was not a strings person and she wasn't teaching um, in, in the instrumental studies. She was in out, educational outreach. I think she was in charge of it at the time. Um, but again, she, she and I connected um, and I really picked her brain. I was like, I'm getting ready to go into the real world. It, it's New York City. <laughs> I go home. I get a job. Can you help me out? You know, kind of thing. And just kind of helping me so many years after I graduated. And I think it's so valuable. Um, Sphinx is another, another incredible community. Um, I have a lot of people here that I pick their brains with all the time. One of them is Adrian Thompson. I don't know if you guys know her. We call her Mama Bear in the strings um, instrumental part. Um, but she's now out of Chicago. And just having an older person or a seasoned person is what I like to call people now, um, a wiser person, just to share their own experiences. Obviously, everybody's experiences is different. And you know our paths are our own paths, right? But to get the wisdom of how they were able to navigate um, can be an encouraging um, when you're trying to navigate your own path. Now that I'm in the space that I am in, I find it very, very, very important to be a mentor. Um, I'll just, I want to say this story really, really quickly. I was teaching, um, we, at, we at Berkeley have a program called Five Week, where high school kids can uh, apply, and they come to Berkeley for five weeks. They're taking Berkeley courses by Berkeley teachers, and they're having private, well, we call it private instruction, cello lessons, <laughs> and uh, with actual faculty from Berkeley. So it's pretty, pretty cool. I had a student who came in my door, and she kind of like slowly <laughs> and through. I saw this beautiful girl um, with this beautiful hair. And so she closed the door. She said, excuse me, are you Miss Patrice Jackson? I said, yeah. She said, OK. She closed the door. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, uh, OK. <laughs> and she was like, oh my god, I love you. Uh, when I was, when I played the cello because of you. I remember when you went strings and you was on the cover of Strings magazine. And I said, I want to be like her when I grow up. And then when I was in high school, I did a research paper on her. And I'm like, I was like what? <laughs> <laughs> so I had no idea um, winning a competition like this had that kind of impact. And you know, I'm going through my own life and my ups and downs after graduating and stuff. But it wasn't until I came back into this week's family that I now, you know, seeing students, I remember that were little kids when I won and now that they're competing. And then others that I remember, um, you know, people that I've, I competed with and we're all having our own jobs and all of this stuff. And it's just how beautiful that circle comes back around. Um, so you, the takeaway is just whether you're a student um, an educator, an administrator, just know that people are always looking up and watching. There, you know, <laughs> believe it or not, okay, there's something called, I'll make this real quick, there's something called an intentional mentor. And every time I've ever been asked to serve as a mentor for a new faculty, I, I have never done that. When I taught high school, I wouldn't even have a student teacher because I didn't think I had anything to teach. You know, and now I, I look back and I kind of wish I had had that experience because I did have stuff to share with them. And, um, but I've never at the university, you know, oh, well, we need this. I won't do that. And, you know, and mentoring to me, it just happens. You know, you don't go into it with the idea, oh, I'm going to mentor you. Because my first year as a college professor, the trombone professor, nothing against trombonists, but was assigned to be my faculty mentor, you know, white male and nice person, but I think he was scared of me. He'd come in my office and he'd be like, almost like, you know, kind of nervous and you know, this kind of, and I'd kind of make fun, not make fun, but I kind of, I kind of mess with him sometime. I did, I did, because I said, I said, I'm obviously in I'm like, you don't know me from, you know, you, they hired me here, but you know, but why are you, but he was just so uncomfortable, he didn't know what to say, he picked his words carefully. But, you know, and that was my first mentor. And so I was like, I'm not doing that. But what happens with mentorship is that it just evolves. You know, people come, you know, to ask you your, your information, your advice, or whatever, suggestion. And so when I say, close the door, 
the D-O-E, the dough. I'm finna tell you something. And so you can take it as you, as you want to, and sometimes I can't tell you why I'm telling you that. But you take it as you need to. Um, but but it, it just happens. And, and then when somebody says, oh, well, he's, I consider him a man. I don't, Blair, I'm not his mentor. He's my mentor. You know, because he has, um, what, what, did, what did I tell the lady the other day? He has an uncompromising spirit. Church lingo, right? Uncompromised. <laughs> what do I mean? Musical standard, quality, fairness, mentorship. He's uncompromising. Because when he come in my rehearsal at Florida International, I'm like, oh, crap. The whole wind ensemble would be like, not just the horns, they would be just terrified, just sweat, <laughs> you know. The whole wind ensemble would sit up. When he, all he had to do was walk in the room. Look, I would stand up a little straighter, you know. But he, had, he set a standard, you know, uncompromising. And I've seen him get on, get on some cases a few times. I'm glad I wasn't ever on the receiving end of that. But, <laughs> you know, I was like, why is he so mean? I, underst <laughs> I understood why he was so mean. You know, and so I respect that. I admire that. So he didn't need me as a mentor, but you know, it, it just happens. And when people say that about me, I just don't know what to say, you know, and I just try to share and learn and keep sharing and keep learning as much as I can. And when I stop, you know, learning, especially like the kids say, I need to have several seats <laughs> and sit on that. <laughs> So again, we're running a little bit behind, so we're going to go to the Q&A. So if anybody has any questions here in the room, please come forward. And then we'll also alternate between folks here and folks streaming. Hi. Hi. My name is Jane Lindemood. I teach 6 through 12 orchestra in Dodge City, Kansas. Um, my school is... Um, about 70% Hispanic, 10% white, the rest a balance of other um, flavors of BIPOC communities. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I'm of the paler persuasion. When it comes to helping my students navigate this matrix, I am so very outside of it. What can you recommend for me or for them that I can better assist them going from a school where they are the majority? Mm -hmm. And most of them, if and when they go to college, whatever field they're in, will be at PWIs. Right. How can I best assist them to prepare for that change of environment going from majority to minority sure. environments? Sure. Great question. Patrice? I'd like to chime in. Um, one, of the, one of the biggest, biggest, biggest things that I could suggest is encouraging your students to go to these summer music camps. Um, that will be the biggest culture shock and eye opener. And culture shock, granted, for obvious reasons, but also to let the students know where they are mm -hmm. as far as their um, musical abilities as well. Um, so, it's, so it's not as just about Oh, you're good for that. It's about, oh, wait, wait, wait now. Hold on. I'm hearing, oof, I'm hearing Prokofiev and Dvorak. I was still stuck on that song. I'm sorry, I'm talking cello wise. <laughs> <laughs> One of my best kids is a cellist so, right now. So, yeah. So, that, if, from, even for me, um, I started going to camps when I was 12 and 13. Um, and the, also, it will also help with social skills as well. Because if, you, if they are finding themselves in these, spaces where they are the only or very few, you gotta learn at an early age how to navigate and not just be mad all the time, you know. Good job. So are we gonna, I have to ask the staff, are we gonna do, okay, go ahead. This is from Anonymous. What advice do you have for POC working towards being an educator in higher ed? You want to take that one, Mel? Uh, advice. Sure, advice. Um, to be patient and to be kind with yourself. Rome was not built in a day. You won't be either. And I am still learning and growing all the time. I tell my students, especially with 
I don't know everything about the French horn. I don't think anybody ever does or will about their instrument. So I say we're all learning and growing together. But I think it's important to be kind to yourself and be patient. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Um, I before I ask a question, I also wanted to answer a question. Um, I think that another uh, thing that you could do to help your students is just give them access to spaces like here, like all these events are being live streamed, and even the past iterations of the conference I think are available. So if you can't bring them here, bring here to them. So that's one thing. Um, I have a lot of questions. But I'll just ask one. Um, what do you all think about diversity statements on applications uh, for jobs as, a, as people of color? And how, how do you approach them without being angry? Or do you approach them with anger and with emotion? Yeah. So. OK, I said I wasn't going to cuss. <laughs> and I haven't so far. But I think from, from hearing your comment that you understand that most of the time that they, I, I can't, shouldn't say that they don't mean anything, but most of the time they're checking a box because they have to, they, they have to put that statement in there. You know, and, and I'll say in the <clears throat> aftermath of George Floyd, and it's a shame that it took somebody being murdered right in front of our eyes for people to automatically, suddenly see the light, oh, I need to be more diverse, I need to have a black conductor, I need to have a black French horn player, you know, I need to have a woman, a black woman, God, that's a double woman, you know, um, you know, and all of a sudden, I mean, these things have existed, oh, I need to play a piece by Florence Price, well, I rem the, the guy was talking the other day and talked about um, where she had written a letter to the Boston Symphony, he said Philadelphia was Boston because I read the letter, but, um, um, <laughs> sent some, one of her scores, they never responded. And then I remember a few years ago, after George Floyd, I saw, read somewhere where the Boston Symphony had programmed. I said, well, it took 100 years, but they, at least they finally did it. And I hate to say better late than never, so don't ever say that to me. Because I'm like, better for whom? It wasn't better for Florence Price, right. you know? So don't say that to me. Right. So. It's just something that, that you have to, that we have to deal with. But it sounds like, just hearing your comments, that you are aware of that, you know, and you just take it and use it for you, for your best interests. You know, you talk the talk, you do whatever you have to do, you know, but just know that they're not serious, you know, and painting Black Lives Matter on the street. Well, it's snowing now, so we can't even see it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I didn't cuss. Um, I wanted to add a little bit to this because that was my stance. Um, but again, being in spaces that I'm in, um, I get asked to for opinions, like authentic opinions. So there's a school up in um, Wisconsin, I believe, that um, actually called me up. The gentleman um, was interested in hiring. Um, a, or fulfilling a position, I can't say what it is, but fulfilling a position that was open. The school really wanted more that, um, and a more inclusive statement in the application process to try to draw a wider pool. And for whatever reason, this person called me and was like, we have a stipend that we'd like to, um, because I want to spend some time and pick your brain, the correct verbiage, I don't want to offend anybody, and da, da, da. And we spent about a month um, over Zoom and I felt like that was very intentional, and I appreciated that approach. Um, at the same time at Berkeley, um, there was a situation with my boss where he was asked to um, do a project or write a, um, write a paper, um, again, talking about the lack of diversity that it asked. So he solicited, solicited a few people, and I was one of them. And we went over and over and over these revisions. And well, I didn't like that verbiage. Okay, let's go back to the genre. I didn't really like that. Well, I would, if I were this, I wouldn't, da, 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 you know, that kind of thing. So I'm just saying that publicly to say to all of institutions that are finding themselves having to write these kind of statements to please utilize the people that you already have. Yes. And I promise you, we're not going to set you up for failure because we want to see our own friends where we are, right? Um, and if it's, something that can be of help 
especially just as simple as having a committee meeting and making sure a person, uh, black and brown or an inclusive or indigenous person is in the room, that can be monumental, especially for in, you know applicants as well. Mm -hmm. I think we have time for one more, one more question. All right, and I'm, I wrote this down because I'm kind of shaking also a little bit. Um, all right, uh, so a couple words for, for you guys. Um, uppity, bougie, not really black, not black enough. Um, I had a friend when I was in college, my best friend, predominantly white institution, who said to me one day that um, black people really need to let slavery go. Um, talking about the Carlton effect, right? Um, band nerd, and you know, for a black kid growing up in Atlanta, Georgia, which is where I'm from, I knew what the code word for that was. Mm -hmm. Somebody, you know, was me. So we're talking about going back to the, this idea of microaggressions. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, when, when I went off to leave from an HBCU because I felt they didn't have the resources that um, I would have liked and went across the track to FSU to talk to a um, professor who shall remain nameless um, to show them some of my music that I've written. They kind of chuckled to themselves and said, this sounds like cartoon music. Um, first of all, I'd thank you guys for being here. Where were you guys like 15, 20 years ago? Um, <laughs> we were here. <laughs> Um, that was, I guess, my first question. <laughs> the second question was, what can I do to, to make these kind of things stop? I'll, I'll jump in real quick. But the first part of your question, you know, you need use some words. So some people don't know this about me, but I've, I've had this um, nerdy fascination with etymology or word history, and even more specifically, the history of the alphabet you know, and the English alphabet in particular, because it's not an accident, A, B, the order that they come in, and there are all kinds of reasons for that, you know, and so I take very seriously words, because words is only, word is only one letter different from world, and words make worlds, you know, so language, and so one of the first things that I do when I'm doing a presentation or teaching a class, I pull out the Oxford Standard English Dictionary. Well, let's define um, minority. You know, as you read this definition. But then the, the thing is, that definition, if you look at different editions of that same dictionary, that meaning changes. So the meaning of words changes over time. You know, 20 years ago, we, you know, we're the only race that, you know, you're black, you're Negro, you're colored, you know, you're this, you're that. You know, but all those words, see, those are trigger words. And, and you've got to know them. And, and I have an activity that I do in my class, a, a couple of things. See, and I'm constantly outside of my discipline. I hang out with the psychologists, the sociologists, the historians, the um, communications people, and I learn from them. And so when, you, when I'm reading, and I'm re always reading outside of my discipline to learn strategies, things to do, and I'm, so I, I've got bibliographies. I don't need to put this on a website somehow, some handouts that I've done over the years to share. And I hope that, that Sphinx will let me do that. Just some things that I have created over the years. But I'm reading, you know, Sheikh Anta Jop, The African Origin of Civilization. I'm reading Francis Cress Wilson. I'm reading David Elliott, Music Matters. I'm reading um, Urugo, an Afri African-centered perspective, a critique of European thought by you, uh, Marima Ani, you know, what she talks about aesthetics, the definition of what is beautiful. Well, the European aesthetic is different from the African aesthetic, but that's the same discussion we have when we talk about classical music. And I asked my music appreciation class, I said, does Mexico have classical music? And they were like, and then forget it when I said, um, what about um, country music, you know? And they were sitting there, you know, I said, the name of this, or I should say Western music. I asked the question, because it was like appreciation of Western music. I said, what is Western music? Why didn't they call it Eastern music or Southern music? And one person raised their hand, and I didn't laugh in his face, but it tickled me. He thought I was talking about country and Western music. 
And so that's when I put the Mercator map up there and show them, you know, how that map centers Western Europe as the center of civilization. And that's how I started my music appreciation class. And then we go from there, talking about colonizing. And I include all of that, you know, but words are very important to me. And, and you have to have your words that you believe in. You have to be flexible. You have to know the definitions. And you have to be flexible sometime and adjust because they change over time, you know. And, uh, but, but yeah, but there, there's certain things like phrases, you know, well, it's close enough for jazz. It's not close enough for anything. What are you saying, jazz? If you're out of tune, you're not playing precise, that's okay. It's close enough? No, it's not close enough. It's not, is it close enough for Tchaikovsky? You know? So don't come, don't, look, get out of my face with that. <laughs> you know? But, but words are important. Language, I guess what I'm saying. And so I've got some handouts that I've done about that. Black and white. What's the definition of black? What's the definition of white? Pros, pro positive words that refer to black, pro positive words that refer to white, and negative. And, and, it's, and I always know what's going to happen. The black students get mad because there are always more negative words associated with black. And they can't think of any more positive words. There, there's some positive ones, and I share a few that they maybe didn't think about, you know. But um, it, it's, words are serious. And they're important. And so I've, I've got some things that I've, I've learned from the sociologists and the psychologists to do. Even though I'm a musician, again, I'm outside of my discipline. And that has done more for me, I tell you. You know? Thank you. I'll just piggy piggyback just very, very shortly on that and say, you, you, you can't stop the words, but what you can do is work on how those words affect you. you know, one of the things that I talk about with my mentees a lot is just meet people where they are. If somebody is you know, using those words to describe you or, or in, in conversation, that gives you an idea of kind of what their mentality is you're not going to have an intelligent conversation with that person, right? You just, you're not going to. So they don't need to stop their words. Look inward and think about how does, why are these words triggering you? You don't have to play this game where you react to the words. You know who you are, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. There's nothing more powerful sometimes, though, than a rest on a piece of music. Rests are powerful. Silence is powerful. Extremely powerful. So we are out of time. Please uh, help me thank our wonderful panel. And thank you all for being here this afternoon. We appreciate you. Thank you. Have a good day. <laughs>